There it goes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first National History Day in Arizona workshop. What is history, historical thinking, and National History Day 101? My name is Jamie Adams, and I'm the curator of education for the Arizona Historical Society. I'm also a staff historian for the Arizona Historical Society, and perhaps more importantly for today's session, I am the Arizona Affiliate National History Day Coordinator. Um, I'm based out of Tucson. I got my master's in history. I'm a practicing historian in the field. I'm really excited to get to talk with you all today a little bit about what is history, what is historical thinking, what is National History Day, and how all those things come together. Also joining us today is Allison Avery, who is going to help me coordinate the Central Arizona Regional Contests. So, maybe. Well, what is history? So history is the study of the past. But more than that, it's an intellectual process, it's a craft, it's an art, it's a science and it's a tradition. And it helps us connect to one each other, one each other when we have a shared past or we can find elements of a shared past, it really helps us make those connections between each other. History, however, is not a list of facts. History is actually that connective tissue between facts. And history is the so what of why all those facts matter. The so what and why does it matter are key. And as a historian, it is your job to explain why something matters. So a little bit about the practice of history thinking, the history of history, which is also called historiography. So history, because it's not just facts, but rather the interpretation of evidence, history changes as we change, as human beings, as we understand each other differently, as our society changes and as our culture changes. So in the Western tradition, history has changed in three major ways in the recent past, recent past being relative of like the last 300 years. So from the mid 1800s to the 1950s or so, history is professionalizing and becoming dominated by educated men who write about things that they think are important. That's military history, the history of wars, the history of political figures. Biography is really interesting or biography is really big in this time period. Lots of biographies of important men. They call this the great man period. Women and people of color are largely absent from the history writing from history writing and therefore the historical process. Uh, women and people of color tend to exist in history as like subservient to these great men or part of the great man story, but not really a major actor in the great man story. And that begins to shift in the 1960s after the Second World War. Uh, Would-be historians trained in the social sciences like economics, anthropology, political science, apply the scientific method and their social studies trainings to the study of history to create what they call social history. So social history asks the question, what if society is the main plot of the past? And it really shifts the way that people are thinking. So instead of thinking the of the great men in history, they're actually thinking from the bottom up. They're looking at the lived experiences of everyday people, and asking what happens if less powerful people control, control the historical narrative. And in the 1970s, we have another big shift. So in the 70s, people who learn to think about the past from those social historians start to challenge their teachers by asking, well, society is great, but what role does culture play in the historical past? And we call this the cultural turn. These cultural historians consider how culture changes and how that change impacts the way people think about the past. And during this time period, non-traditional, which is kind of funny because oral tradition storytelling are actually some of the most traditional ways of preserving the past. Um, but if you look back at those men from the Victorian era who are professionalizing and going to college, they would consider these non-traditional methods of recording the past, like oral history and storytelling. So because those methods are becoming popularized in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, women and people of color have greater access to history creation and can tell their own stories from their own perspective. So why does any of that matter? That's kind of the crux of the issue, right? As historians, we're always asking ourselves, well, why does any of this matter? So the value of history 
is in how point of view perspective changes the way that people think about the past. Everyone has a different interpretation of the past and not only is that valid and good, it is completely necessary. And if you can understand where someone is coming from, you can understand why they think a certain way or why they feel a certain way. Um, and ultimately, we study the past because we're trying to harness and enhance our ability to be empathetic, our ability to understand someone else's feelings. Um, I always say that it doesn't matter how different we all are from each other in 2021, there is no one more different from you than a person who lived 100 years ago. So it really helps us put our differences aside and it really helps us empathize with people from the past. So thinking a little bit about how we actually do that. Now we kind of have our goal in mind. We have a sense of what we're trying to accomplish here. How do we do that? Well, we're looking for clues. History is a mystery and we're always looking for clues. So historians, once they get a hunch or a working thesis, they start to gather evidence. Historians consult a wide body of evidence. They look at newspapers, they look at journals, photographs, clothing, whatever information they can find that they think will further their point. Or more importantly, challenge their assumptions, right? When you, when you create a thesis statement, when you write a hypothesis, for those of us that are more familiar with the scientific method, when you write a hypothesis, you do an experiment. And when you have that experiment, you look at the results of the experiment and you go, is my hypothesis still true? History works the same way. So we can't just look for information that agrees with us. We need to also consider how others might have approached the same topic, how differing viewpoints might have changed the situation. So it's not just about finding the works that you agree with, it's about finding the works that could potentially challenge your thesis. So this is a little bit of an interactive activity. And so if you wanna put your answer in the chat as we move forward, um, thinking about different types of historical evidence. So what is a primary source? So we've got two major kind of bodies of evidence. We've got primary sources and we've got secondary sources. So I think sometimes people think a primary source is their most important source or maybe their oldest source. And that's not always the case. So a primary source is a source that directly connects to the people and the events that you're studying. It was created at the same time in the event that you're studying, and it really captures an individual's personal experience with that event either at the time or their reflection on that event much later in their lives. And that distinction is important, but they're both still primary sources, right? When we think about the passage of time and we think about how time can impact someone's memory of an event, we have to take that into consideration. Okay, so that's all well and good. So what's a secondary source? So if a primary source is something that is directly connected to the events and people that's occurring, a secondary source is an analysis of those primary sources. So it's a removed account of people or events. It's materials created to comment or understand an event or idea. So as a historian, when you write a paper for class, or let's say you're working on your performance for National History Day, you are creating a secondary source. You are creating a unique interpretation of primary and secondary source materials that gives a unique perspective on the topic. So thinking about different kinds of sources, let's see if we can classify these kinds of sources. So the first source is a book written about Pearl Harbor in 1975. Pearl Harbor was in the 40s, so that's going to be a secondary source. What about a letter from Thomas Jefferson to his friend. That might be tricky depending on what the content of the letter is, but typically something like that is going to be a primary source. How about an interview with an activist at a protest? So this is not an interview with an expert commenting on a protest. This is an interview with an activist at a protest, so it's a primary source. An article from a peer-reviewed journal. So peer-reviewed means that when an article is submitted to a journal, a bunch of experts read the article and make sure that 
it's up to snuff. Make sure that it's not making outlandish claims, make sure that it's kind of in step with the general historical thinking on a topic, even if it vastly disagrees with the general historical thinking on a topic. So an article from a peer-reviewed journal is going to be a secondary source. What about something like a dress? What about a three-dimensional object? So three-dimensional objects tend to be primary sources. I think that sometimes we're a little hesitant to use three-dimensional objects when we work on our history projects, but a dress can tell you just as much about an event as a photograph can. So there are different tools for understanding how to read three-dimensional sources as primary sources. And we're going to be having a workshop later in the workshop series about analyzing primary sources, and we'll discuss how to analyze three-dimensional objects. And then finally, a textbook. So textbooks tend to be secondary sources. I would say nine times out of 10. That 10th time, I think the only exception could be if you were writing a treatise on the history of history education and you cited a textbook as an example. So then that would be a primary source. It's usually a secondary source. Sometimes these categories are interchangeable depending on how you're using them for your piece, but by and large, the difference between primary and secondary source is pretty clear. So once you gather those sources, it's important to start reading and understanding them. You always want to ask yourself, how does this piece of evidence further my argument? And now that I know this piece of information, do I need to reevaluate my thesis statement? Do I need to make changes to my original hypothesis? And if you need help, we're going to be having workshops on analyzing secondary and primary sources. Our workshop on analyzing secondary sources is going to be on September 11th. And our workshop on analyzing primary sources is going to be on October 16th. And if you're following along and you're filling out your roadmap on the way, the secret code word for today's session is Flagstaff. So if you complete your worksheet and you attend seven of the nine, I think there are nine workshops, and you submit that to the National History Day in Arizona email address, nhbaz at azhs.gov by, I think I put December 1st as the due date, you'll get a special treat at the state uh, award ceremony in the spring. So the secret code word for today's session is Flagstaff. Okay, so, but a historical argument, I don't wanna fight with anyone. I don't wanna be in an argument, neither do we. So argument has come to largely mean a heated exchange of differing ideas, but argument can also be a well-organized set of reasons that are used to persuade someone to agree with you. Think of what lawyers do in a courtroom. That's an argument. When historians talk about arguments, they mean that. They mean a well-organized set of reasons that are persuasive. So historical argument is key. In National History Day, we're not looking for a report of the past. We're looking for your interpretation of the past and your interpretation of the past is largely an argument. So every historical argument has three major parts. Parts two and three can be replicated over and over and over again, depending on certain constraints of your project, how much evidence you have, how long your project is, if there's a page limit or a word limit, et cetera. So the first big chunk that you need is a thesis statement. You need to have an argumentative statement that's one or two sentences that really sums up what you're trying to say. Then you need your evidence, and then you need your analysis of your evidence. And if you need help writing a thesis, um, that secondary source workshop is also a thesis writing workshop, and that's gonna be on September 11th. So we'll talk about this in depth on September 11th, but it's important that you allow your thesis statement to guide your paper. So every thesis statement in the whole wide world boils down to thing is thing because X, Y, Z. Where the things are nouns, concepts, ideas, connections to the national theme, if you're working on this for National History Day, and X, Y, and Z are reasons you believe this relationship to be true. So once you have your thesis statement, it's really important that you let that structure your paper. Your body paragraphs will then be structured like thing is thing because reason one, evidence piece one, X. 
evidence that presents the relationship between the two things as it relates to X, and then analysis about that evidence. Um, this is a pretty formulaic way of writing. And of course, once you kind of master thesis writing, you don't have to use a formula, but you have to learn the rules before you can write them. So it's really important to think about your thesis as the thing that guides your paper. It's also really important that when you're listing things in your thesis statement, in your paper, they're in the same order, right? So you can't say thing is thing because X, Y, Z, and then start with Y. You need to start with X. So those are just some mechanical things that we can talk about when we talk about editing. But it's really important, even before you start researching, that you come up with a draft thesis and you let your thesis guide your process. So making a point. Historical arguments and arguments in general eventually make some kind of point. Because each National History Day year has a theme, your argument must connect to the theme in addition to making whatever point it is that you're seeking to make. So it's really important that when you select a topic, you ensure that you are not just picking an obvious choice, right? I'll give a really good example. Last year, the theme for National History Day was communication and history. A really obvious choice might be to do your project on Alexander Graham Bell. But you can't just assume that your audience will agree with you. You can't just assume that your audience believes or knows that Alexander Graham Bell is the father of modern communication. You need to convince them of that point using your thesis statement and the evidence that you find during your research. All right, so that's kind of history in a nutshell and what historians do in a nutshell. Now changing gears slightly about how we're actually going to apply that to National History Day. So National History Day is a project-based learning program, or PBL, where the students get to be historians. That means you get to explore your own interests and you get to tell us why it's important. You can choose anything that you can choose any topic you like, so long as you connect it to the annual theme. And if you need help understanding the annual theme, which for 2022 is communication and no, 2022 is debate and diplomacy, successes, failures, and consequences. So if you need help understanding the theme, join us for our theme workshop next Saturday. Uh, same time, same place, same meeting link. Um, it's on September 4th. So National History Day is a year-long academic program that focuses on historical research, analysis, and argumentation. National History Day in Arizona is the history education component of that. So National History Day in Arizona, we do National History Day for grades 4 through 12. We provide training like this. We also provide project consultation. So if down the road you're working on your project and you've hit a wall, send us an email. We're happy to help you. Uh, we serve thousands of students in the state of Arizona, and we currently have four regional contests and then one state contest. So our regions are Northern Arizona, Central Arizona, and Southern Arizona. The county's broken up like this. Um, let's say you're in Pinal County, but it's easier for you to get to Tucson than it is for you to get to Phoenix. Send us an email. We'll figure out how to make an exception for you for your contest. But we want to try to keep these regions as separated as possible um, just for accounting purposes, but if something happens and you have an important soccer game the day of your regional contest or life happens, send us an email. We're happy to make an accommodation for you. The Central Arizona competition is split into two competitions, East Valley and West Valley, and this is kind of a map that shows the distinction um, pretty much separated by I-17 with the exception of Phoenix and Guadalupe. Those have been assigned uh, regional contests to help kind of keep the numbers as even as possible. Um, like I said, if you have something that's come up in your life and you need to go to a different contest, just let us know. Some tentative contest dates for 2022. West Valley, we're looking at late February. Northern, early March. East Valley, mid-February. Southern, late March, with a state contest in early April. Um, we're hoping to be in person this year but um, National History Day is going to make a call in November. And um, if we need to switch to virtual, we can, we've done it before, but we're really hoping to be in person this year. All right, so National History Day 101, the theme. Each year, National History Day has a different theme and that theme is designed to help you organize your thoughts and explore specific facets, specific 
uh, aspects of your interests as a historian. The theme is super, super, super important. You can't just kind of riff and do your own thing. Your project must connect to the theme. Make sure that you read the theme book for guidance and inspiration. And you can find the theme book on the National History Day website or on the National History Day in Arizona website. And once again, you get through all this stuff, I'll show you how to navigate our website. If you need help connecting your interest to the theme, ask for help. And don't forget about our theme workshop, which is going to be next Saturday, September 4th. Okay, as important as theme are the rules. So students, it is your responsibility to read and understand the rules for National History Day. Uh, your project might look different when you submit it to your teacher because your teacher might be looking for certain skills that align with whatever it is that you're, they're teaching. And if that's the case, you need to make those changes necessary in order to make sure your project is in compliance with the National History Day rules. Read the rule book, very, very important. And if you have questions about rules, we're here to help. The rules are kind of less important in this earlier researching part, but as you start drafting your project and start putting things together, it's really important that you know the length of the documentary or how many words are in your process paper. Make sure you read the rule book to get all of that information. Okay, National History Day 101 divisions. In Arizona, we have three divisions. We have the youth division, which is grades four and five. We have the junior division, which is middle school grades six, seven, and eight. And then we have the senior division, which is high school, grades nine, 10, and 11. So this is a really important distinction. National History Day only recognizes the senior and junior divisions. And only junior and senior students are eligible to go to the national contest in June. If you're a fourth or fifth grader and you're still interested in participating in National History Day, we are happy to have you. You just can't go to the national contest until you're in the sixth grade. But it's still really great, a really great opportunity to start thinking about how National History Day works and gives you a little bit more experience in creating your project. So the National History Day categories, there are five project categories. Paper, which is probably the most traditional for history thinking. Performance, where you write a script, you can do a musical, you can do a skit, you can do whatever you like, but it's a live performance. An exhibit where you kind of put on your museum curator hat and you think about how a museum would present this information. Documentary, where you get to play Ken's Burn, Ken Burns for a little bit and create a short documentary about your topic. And then website, where you get to do some coding and create your own website. When picking a category, it's really important to think about your own interests and the topic that you've selected. Some topics are better suited to visual representation than others. So a really good example is uh, if you want to do a project on ancient people, ancient indigenous people of the American Southwest, great. If you don't have a lot of photographs, maybe an exhibit is not a good choice. Maybe you want to write a paper. Or if you have an abundance of photographs, maybe a documentary is a better choice than a performance, for example. So always want to think about kind of your own interests, if you're interested in computer science, if you're interested in theater, and then your topic when you're picking your category. You can work by yourself, you can work independently, or you can work into a team of up to five. And you can work in a group in all categories except for paper. That's really important. Paper projects are always solo projects. You can work in pairs. But it's preferred that you, if you work in a group, your group have three to five people in it. That way, if something happens to one of your teammates, if they're sick, if they don't want to compete, if they can't compete, you can still compete. And once you submit a project for regionals, you cannot change your project category. You are locked in. So a couple other things to think about when we're thinking about National History Day 101. National History Day asks that you write a process paper. And so a process paper is exactly what it sounds like. It's a short essay that goes with your project where you explain your process, how you got to your topic, how it relates to the annual theme, what your historical argument is, and why it's significant. All project categories must have a process paper. And then see the rule book for details about the process paper. Websites, your process paper is embedded in your website. Paper, it's attached to your final paper. 
So just make sure that you read the rules about your particular project category when you're putting your final submission packet together. And then finally, the last kind of big National History Day 101 topic is the annotated bibliography. So as historians, we love to cite things. So it's always very important that you have a bibliography. But an annotated bibliography is kind of the next step. So annotated bibliography is about a bibliography where you include short annotations, where you talk about the sources that you've consulted. This is the big difference. So it's not a works cited page. You have to include all of the sources that you consult, not just the works that you cite. There is a distinction there. You can use MLA or Chicago style, depending on what you know, what you're more comfortable with. Historians prefer Chicago style. If you're interested in learning Chicago style, there are lots of resources out there, um, but MLA will work just fine. So your annotation should be short, about two to three sentences, and you should talk about how you use the source and how it helped to further your argument. And as always, see the rules for more details about the annotated bibliography, how to format it, where it should go in your submission packet, all of those things. Okay, so the very last thing that I wanna cover is the National History Day in Arizona website. So if you go to, um, let me actually show that slide again so I don't say this wrong. If you go to azhs.org slash nhdaz, it will take you to this page, National History Day in Arizona. So here on this landing page, you can get information about the theme. You can Im get information about upcoming workshops. You can register for upcoming workshops. So some of our workshops are going to have an interactive component and it's optional to register. But if you do register for the workshop, we can sort you into breakout rooms and make sure that you're getting kind of leveled information that's important to you as you kind of work through your project. So it's also got a direct link to the theme book. And then the theme video, which is really important if you're still trying to parse out the theme. And then finally, a link to the National History Day website. And then there are all these tabs across the top. So for students, this tab is going to be really important. It has a link to the theme book, the rule book, a graphic organizer to kind of help you think through your ideas and think through your interests. Some interesting research links about where do you actually find these materials checklists and evaluation forms for all of the different categories. Um, performance companion worksheet was something that we did for the virtual contest. It's being tweaked. Um, if we're in person, we probably won't need it. If we're virtual, there's probably going to be a different version of it. So don't worry too much about this performance companion worksheet just yet. And then there's also a direct link to your contest portal for each of the regional contests and state. And that's where you'll register. That's where you'll upload components of your project. Um, that's where you'll tell us what your t-shirt size is. So if you get promoted to state, you can get a t-shirt, all of those different things. So that's important for students. This is also important for students. If you're interested in doing an Arizona history topic or want to do some archival research in an archive, um, historical, the Arizona Historical Society has two archives. There's the, actually we've got four, but the easiest to access are the archives in Tempe at the Arizona Heritage Center and the archives in Tucson at the Arizona History Museum. But these are digital archives. So if you're interested in doing research on topics that relate to Arizona, like the US-Mexico border, Japanese incarceration, the Mexican-American civil rights movement, and then we're working on this really interesting collection of letters about the Equal Rights Amendment in Arizona. So these are gonna be direct links to digital collections, digital archives, where you can do archival research. Another important tab for students is gonna be this special awards tab. So every year at the state contest, we award cash prizes for certain topics or certain methodologies for students. And so if you're still kind of on the fence about what topic you want to choose, and maybe you're interested in getting a little bit of a cash prize before you head to college or maybe go to, I don't know, Disneyland in August, um, this might be a good place to look. So um, different awards for different topics, like um, awards about histories of anti-Semitism or awards about women or women's history. And then there are a couple methodological awards. So one for using Arizona archives. We're working on one for using oral histories. So you want to check out this tab and see kind of what all the special prizes we're awarding for this year. And I think that that is about it for today's presentation. 
So just a reminder of the rest of the workshops that are coming in this series. So we've just completed this one, this What is History Info session. The next workshop is going to be the theme workshop on the 4th, on September 11th. There's a thesis writing and secondary source workshop, September 25th. There is a, a workshop about navigating archives and how to do online research. October 2nd, there is hopefully an in-person archival visit day. Um, details about that are going to go up on the website very soon. You do have to register for that in-person archives visit, but all of those details will be uploaded to the NHDAZ website very, very soon. And so I'm going to end the recording so we can take Q&A from our students who are joining us live. And I will also post an FAQ to go along with this video from any questions that anyone asks. Um, in the meantime, if you have any additional questions, you can email us at nhdaz at azhs.gov, and we'll see you next time.